Okay, uh, tonight we're going to do not the usual presentation, which is usually an overview of the town that I'm speaking in. I'm going to give you uh, sort of a, why the canal was built and why it was important, and maybe a little bit in the middle of Simsbury, but you know, that's about it. So we shouldn't have a long, long talk. So to begin, uh, in 1800, overland transportation was very difficult. Roads where they existed at all were narrow, ungraded, unpaved, and surfaced with rocks and ruts. Depending on the time of year, they were muddy, dusty, or snow-covered, and there were very few bridges across rivers and streams. Because transportation was time-consuming and difficult, most people rarely traveled more than a few miles from home. They ate and they wore what they produced on their farms, and they used products that were manufactured locally. Unless one lived within a few miles of either the Connecticut River or Long Island Sound, any surplus production one might have and wish to sell was usually priced out of the market by the cost of transportation. A certain goods could be altered to make them valuable enough to transport. For instance, you could make cheese out of milk, or you could turn apples into cider brandy, or into, into brandy. But this was not the case with bulky commodities, such as timber, firewood, shingles, copper ore, or bricks. And similarly, the cost of imported goods, like salt and sugar, was increased by the cost of transportation. Now, in 1820, Connecticut had two capitals, Hartford and New Haven. Each was in competition with the other for primacy, in population, in wealth, and in power. The route to all of these lay through trade and commerce. Now, Hartford's located at the head of sloop navigation on the Connecticut River and has access to much of the trade and commerce from northern New England. New Haven, on Long Island Sound, had a commercial trading fleet that traded worldwide, but had absolutely no access to the interior. If a New Haven merchant looked north, he found that it cost as much to send a barrel of fish to Farmington as it did descend to London, England. Now in the early 1820s, New Haven's leaders decided to address this problem by financing and building a canal between their city and Northampton in Massachusetts. This man-made river, somewhat analogous to, today, to today's I-91, would give New Haven access to interior markets. Indeed, canal transportation had several advantages over river transportation in that there would be no current to pull against, there were no falls or rapids to contend with, there were no rocks or shoals, and the channel wouldn't shift after every storm. Canal boats would float on calm water and be pulled across a mirror smooth surface at the almost unbelievable speed of up to four miles an hour which usually brings a laugh, but which is really very realistic in terms of the times, that was remarkable for smooth transportation. When you think that most things were transported on buggies or wagons without springs over roads that were, as I described, with a single horse, and it took a mile an hour, it was pretty good time. And if you were going over Avon Mountain, forget it, it might be days. So uh, a canal offered some real advantages. Now I'm going to start by looking at the route map. This is an 1828 map. Came flat as we have here and folded to put in your pocket to take on the canal so you could find out where you were. Kind of like the maps we got now. The circle is around New Haven on Long Island Sound. And the black line, which runs up like this, is the canal. And it's running up from New Haven through Hamden, and into Cheshire, and eventually up into Southington. Uh, I want you to notice the Connecticut River over here. Boats are going up here to Hartford. But also notice these hills. 
here and here and here. And as we go farther north, we find that this line of hills continues all the way up to Mount Tom in Massachusetts. And it separates this valley that the canal is going to be built in from the Connecticut River, which means that there's a tremendous market for anybody living in this value for using the canal. Because now everything that was too expensive to take over those hills to the Connecticut River can now go to the port of New Haven on the canal boats. So this is a, a potentially a great boom, and this is what part of what New Haven had in mind. Uh, when we see, let's see, we're up here through Southington into Farmington. The other thing I want to talk about is Farmington in 1774. Now, in 1774, Farmington was that big inside the white lines. Its population was larger than Hartford's, and it was second to New Haven. But overall, it was the 13th largest settled area in the colonies. Now, when we go by the revolution and get to 1820, when they're thinking about building the canal, a number of towns have split off. And in area, Farmington is much smaller, although it still contains Avon and Plainville. Uh, However, if you take the populations of what used to be, in 1774, Greater Farmington, and you put them together, you find that the population is 10,500, which is way bigger than Hartford and New Haven. So if you're looking at this from New Haven's point of view, here is a tremendous number of people separated from the river by hills but on Hartford's doorstep, if you can redirect all of this to the port of New Haven, you've pulled a big one on Hartford as far as getting ahead. So this is one reason that the canal was built and possibly also why it was called the Farmington Canal. Nobody will know for sure, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Now, we'll go a little bit farther north and we find we get uh, Northington, which is now Avon was part of Farmington when the canal was built or just splitting off. And then, of course, we get Simsbury and Granby. And then we stop with the Farmington Canal and we start a new canal company, but the same canal. In Massachusetts, it's called the Hampshire and Hamden Canal and is built at the same time. It starts by going through the Congamon Ponds into the town of Southwick and then continues through Westfield and then Southampton, East Hampton, and finally Northampton on the river, where the goal of New Haven is to take some of this traffic from northern New England that Hartford and Middletown have been enjoying and to redirect that to the port of New Haven as well. So New Haven never would have built this canal if it hadn't been able to get to the river at Northampton. On the other hand, by doing so, they opened up a tremendous market in all these towns west of this line of hills between the river and the Pioneer Valley and the Farmington River Valley and farther south. Now, to give you some idea, uh, if I can find out where I am here, how important this was to the people who lived here, I want to use an example from, uh, this is Southampton, Massachusetts. The building is Lyman and Elder's storehouse. It's actually a freight house and store that is built on the edge of the canal in 1834. The canal was opened or completed here in 34 and opened in 35. The wall you see is what's left of the wall of lock 22, a stone lined lock. And the canal used to run right up and down the railroad in the foreground, although about eight feet lower than the railroad. But this was a store and a storehouse. And the canal boats could tie up right there inside the lock and load and unload their goods. And I want you to think that this is on a road, which wasn't very much of a road in 1820, I'm sure. It's about 10 or 12 miles from the river at Northampton. And yet it was supplied with its groceries and its imported needs and its exports through Northampton and the river. Had been doing so for 150 years, more or less. But it's still a long way to go over a dusty, muddy road in the summertime. And in the winter, you can imagine when it snows, and it snowed a lot and the snow got deep, Southampton is pretty well cut off. 
what you had to do in Westfield and Southwick and all these places is stock up because you couldn't go anywhere in the wintertime and not much came in. So I want you to look and see it, take a look at some papers that are at the Southampton Historical Society and they're showing uh, some receipts from a big grocery store in New Haven in November of 1839. Now, the canal usually freezes over about the 1st of December and is closed until May the following year. But here, we find two weeks before the canal is expected to freeze, Mr. Lyman goes to New Haven to the grocery store and he buys, as you see here, gallons and gallons tubs and hogsheads of molasses and sugar and tea, raisins, salt, baking soda, and uh, you know, cinnamon, pipes and tobacco and cloves and nutmeg and casks and nails. And it goes on and on and on. Oil, lumps of sugar, rice, swordfish, and flour. He's got 18 barrels of flour there. And of course, Wrapping paper. They didn't have paper bags then. Everything had to be wrapped. Your customers bought it. So there's the wrapping paper and tea and more swordfish and soap and whatever. Everything to carry this town through the winter. The next day, he comes along and he goes to the store and buys some nuts. And he's got filberts and he's got walnuts and he's got peanuts. And the next day, he finds a bargain at another store and he buys some damaged barrels of flour. Then the next thing we have is this bill of lading from a canal boat, the Ceres, which is a, a boat from Plainville, which delivered all this stuff from New Haven to Southampton. Over 10 tons worth of stuff here. About 10, 10 and a half tons, which was transported up there from New Haven for $31.14. And there's the list of everything with the weights. So this gives you an idea of what this meant to the towns in the valley, even though New Haven might not have built it if they couldn't try to get to the river in Northampton to go north and take that trade. Uh, still, this meant a lot to the towns, including Simsbury. Excuse me. Yes. How many shipments would that take? How many boat loads would that be? I'll tell them one boat. Well, I want one boat. Oh, yeah, okay. these things would carry that much easily. They'd take maybe 20 tons. It's like a, a tractor trailer. It was. 75 feet long, 12 feet wide, and took up to four feet of water, uh, uh, four feet draft, and uh, would carry you know, 15 to 20 tons. So you know this is this is okay. He probably had some other stuff to take to another place when he was going, where he was going. Okay, so that's that's that. Now let's look at the canal in a different way, and I can't do that from here. One more step. Okay. I'm going to look at the canal profile. Now this is how it looked like when it went across the land, starting at New Haven Harbor down here at sea level and going through 22 locks, it climbs all the way up to Southington at lock seven. And then it goes along what's called the long level. And the long level is 26 miles without a lock, which takes us as far as Granby, where you now have to climb six locks to get to the southern summit, thank you, sir, uh, at the level of the Congamon Ponds, which is where the Farmington Canal ends here at the state line, and the Hampshire and Hamden takes off and goes across the ponds, down into the Westfield River Valley, across that, and then up to the Timber Swamp Summit, and continues into uh, Southampton here, and then into East Hampton, and then finally all the way to Northampton and then drops 48 feet to the level of the Connecticut River where they're hoping to, t to tap the trade from northern New England and take it to the port of New Haven. What's so, the question? What's the elevation change, the total elevation change? All, all those locks? Uh, well, it's from zero to 220 feet at the Congamon Ponds and then down to 144 feet in the Westfield River Valley and up to the Timber Swamp Summit. And I can't quote you a number there, but it's another 88 feet up and then back down to the river in uh, Northampton. And it's hard to tell the historic level of the river there since they built the Holyoke Dam because it never goes down to where it used to be. 
but the figure is guessed to be about 98 feet or 96 feet, something like that historically. It's much more than that now because the dam keeps things backed up. So uh, having looked at that, now let's look at the canal itself. I don't want to get to the canal bed and show you how it was built. Uh, in the southern part of the state, generally speaking, where things are flat, but you're still climbing, but the land is basically flat, uh, you dig the canal into the ground like this and you pile the spoil on both sides, on one side to be the 10 foot wide towpath, and on the other side a, a 7 foot wide berm. The ditch is 6 feet deep, containing 4 feet of water, is 20 feet wide at the bottom, and 36 feet wide at the surface of the water and maybe 45 feet wide at the top between the towpath and the berm. And there's a nice example of that to show in northern Cheshire. Uh, this is just north of the Great Fill on the Southington line. And you can see this picture was taken in 1932. Canal went out of business in 1848. So there's been a few years for things to gather and old leaves and branches and debris and grass and whatever. but. You can still see how it's dug into the ground pretty much as I illustrated it in a nice straight line. And this is running east and west uh, along the Cheshire Southington border. Then when we get farther up into the northern part of the state and we're trying to maintain the long level without building locks, to maintain that long level you have to follow the terrain where it's at 182 and a half feet above sea level no matter what the terrain does. So the canal starts to wind back and forth instead of going in a straight line. And doing this, it's seeking that long level along the edges of hills. So here we have what happens on a hillside is you cut your hillside away and you pile the spoil on the downhill side to form the towpath. The berm's place is taken by the side of the hill. And we have a very nice example of that in Simsbury here at Latimer Road, right next to Latimer Road School. And you can see the towpath, which is now a jogging trail. The canal still holds water, and that's how that used to work. Now, when you get some places where you have to dig through a deep hill to keep from going around it, because it would be too long to go around it, you want to go through it and shorten the route of the canal. Sometimes you have to dig a big hole in the ground, and the towpath would be far too high above the water, and so you have to shelf it along the edge of the canal like this. And there's an example of this in Granby, but there's also a nice example here in Avon, where this is the canal cut, which is about 85 feet wide. They have to cut this deep in, into this ridge to get through the center of Avon without going through a big tongue of land that goes down toward the river where the road goes today. Here you can see the towpath shelved into the side of the cut, and the cut, the original level of the land is way up here and it's about an 85 foot wide cut with the canal on the bottom. And then there's one other way they built, and that is across the Congamon Ponds. And here, the virtue, of course, was going in a straight line to keep things as short as possible, but also to get farther from the shore so that you'd have enough water under the keels of the boats to have four feet to float in when they're fully loaded. And so the towpaths were actually built of sand in the pond out from the shore where there was four feet of water on the outside and the animals could pull along and still pull the boats after them. And we don't have a good example of that except for this 1933 picture which shows what look like little islands out here but which really are the old towpaths they used to look something like that. And none of those are there now but they show very nicely in the 1932 aerial survey that Connecticut did, including the Congamon Ponds. And they show in a lot of old pictures from Southwick. Uh, if anybody's interested, I can show you those later. But uh, this is just an example of what they would have looked like. OK, now one other thing. We're talking about going up and down. And we, I should say something about locks. I'm not going to do a lot about locks. But locks are basically boxes. Uh, which fill an empty of water to take your boats from a higher level to a lower level or a lower level to a higher level going up and down steps. And this is important because as you realize the canal is built in levels of which there are 60, 61 actually, on this canal. And 
you can't have water on a slope or it runs away. To keep it calm and flat and smooth, you have to have a constant four feet everywhere. And so to change from level to level as the terrain climbs from New Haven up to Southington, you've got to do this 22 times. It took about five minutes to go through a lock. You can see how the lower gate opened and the boat went into the lock. And then the valve opens on the top and lets the water in from the next higher level. And then <laughs> the gate will open at the top and the boat will go on to the next level. And it does the same thing in reverse if you're going downhill. As I say, it takes about five minutes on this canal to go through a lock, which doesn't sound like much, but when they were running packet boats between New Haven and Northampton on a 24 hour schedule going four miles an hour, they spent five hours going up and down instead of front and <laughs> forwards and backwards. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, no, all right. Next, I'm going to show you what it was all about in New Haven. This is the Canal Basin right next to Long Wharf in New Haven Harbor. Basically, Long Wharf has been here since the 1600s. It ran out like that, and as trade and commerce got busier and boats got bigger, it reached farther and farther out into New Haven Harbor across the mudflats. And at some point, it, it went way out like it shows here in the picture. But when the canal was coming along in 1820, what they did was to build a 1,300 foot long wall like this and enclose about 15 acres of either canal water or Long Island Sound water, depending to a, a depth of about four feet, where they could moor their boats, have a place for them to come down the canal and then tie up against Basin Wharf here and exchange goods with ocean-going ships which were tied up on the outside, uh, or vice versa. Ocean-going ships could unload and put things onto canal boats. There were two pass-throughs at either end, which allowed canal boats to go out into Long Island Sound, and also allowed the, the uh, basin to be drained if you wanted to drain it, or to fill it at high tide if you wanted to raise the level, maybe to clean it out if it got to stink too much. And they could also generate power with water wheels that were in there if they wanted to. Uh, it's 1,300 feet long. It's built on timber, which is laid in the bottom of New Haven Harbor, right in the mud. And on top of that are two stone walls, seven feet wide at the bottom and five feet wide at the top, four feet, 40 feet apart and filled with earth in between to form this, uh, this wharf, basin wharf. And this is what it looked like in the 1938 aerial survey. Uh, you can see the general outlines of it there with Long Wharf and the Harbor Basin. Basically, by this time, it's been filled mostly and has been turned into a railway yard. Uh, you can still see Long Wharf Canal Dock is an, a later addition. I don't know when it was built, but it was after the canal went out of business. But you can still see Basin Wharf going along here with a couple of pass-throughs still in it. This is a very good picture. It's taken in 1865, and it's a picture of the Yale crew sitting in the canal basin, at least part of the canal basin that still has water in it. The western half, as you can see, is filled and has railway cars lined up on it, which are doing the same thing the canal boats did before the railroad came. And outside, you can see the masts of ocean-going ships tied up out there where they're still exchanging goods across Basin Wharf only this time they're coming from railroads instead of canal boats. The eastern pass-through still exists and it's there in the circle. Uh, this is kind of like it looks like on the bottom inside looking inland. This is on the bottom looking out towards the wall. This is the eastern pass-through here. About four feet of water between the bottom and the top and it's not much to look at, but this picture is taken again in 1932 when the western half is pretty much filled for railroad. This probably would be filled very soon after. The only reason it's probably open now is that this is a creek which ran through the city of New Haven and they had to have some way to get it to the ocean. So it's still here doing its thing in all its muddy glory. And here is the pass through close up. This is some of the stone wall I was talking about. Uh, there's another picture of it from the outside. Now we're going to skip up uh, to Farmington. And I want to just show you a couple of things that illustrate more about the canal and, than the local terrain. 
This is from the 1828 map, the original engineering map, which is, as I say, the gold standard. Everything you need to know is on here, and if it still exists, it's still on there. This is the Pequabic River winding in, and the mouth of the Pequabic River is just about here. Uh, we'll be going down here to look at this nice picture, which was taken in 1947. Ruth Scudder, who was a librarian in Farmington. It shows the Farmington River coming down from Unionville and taking a bend toward the center of Farmington. The mouth of the Pequabic River is right here. The Farmington Canal is right here. This is the towpath going along, keeping the canal out of the river. Now, here we see the river and the canal in one picture. But you notice that the river is maybe 25 feet lower than the canal. Now, when the canal was in operation, this part of it was filled with water from the Farmington River. The water's heavy, about 62 and a half pounds a cubic foot. How are huge amounts of water lifted from the river to fill the canal? And you can see there's a sizable difference here. But quite simply, the sun was used as a pump. Green, everybody would love it today. Water vapor goes up and forms clouds. The clouds cause rain. The rain comes down and collects in rivers where it's trapped behind dams, which are located at the highest level of the canal. And from the ponds behind these dams, water is fed into the canal to fill it as is needed. Now, the water in the canal in front of us here in the foreground, if it were there, would have come from behind a dam, which is located three miles north or upstream off the edge of this picture, where the canal and the river are at the same level. And then it would run three miles through a feeder up to the Farmington Aqueduct and another three or four miles down to the center of Farmington and then through Farmington and get over here before the water finally got here from behind the dam three miles upstream. But it's water from that river. It just took a circuitous route to get here. And, but that's how it was done and the sun did all the work. And there really was no other way for them to do it. Uh, they had no sources of power, certainly of this magnitude. Now, if we took this picture we were looking at and we take a right turn and we look up the canal towards Farmington we get this picture which was taken about nine years earlier 1930 38 I guess that says uh, by Mr. Hart and it shows again the towpath going north here and the Farmington River and again the 25 feet between the two and this is a beautiful picture of the canal almost as it was abandoned and it brings up uh, another discussion point, which is the advantages of canal transportation were not all one-sided. There were some distinct disadvantages that came with it. Now, when it was in operation, the canal and its feeders were almost 100 miles long, and they were built on 61 different levels. It was always a problem finding enough water to fill the canal. It was an engineering triumph, but it was hard to keep full of water, except on those occasions when there was too much water. And this being New England and the climate we have, sometimes there's too much water. Now, the water was constantly testing the integrity of the canal. It seeped into the base, uh, into the ground underneath it. It sought weak points in the banks. It leaked out of aqueducts and it leaked out of locks. In fact, the liquid pavement of this highway was in a constant state of suspense, awaiting an event, be it a storm, an operational accident, sabotage, which did happen, or a simple muskrat hole. It would change the dynamic, cause a breach in the canal, and let the water out. And you can imagine this is a disaster because here, you're on the long level. There's 26 miles of water unobstructed, four feet deep. Each linear canal holds three and a half tons of water. The thing's built out of sand. When you get that much water suddenly released 25 feet down into the Farmington River, you get a hell of a big hole and the water runs and it's very expensive to fix. Well, just up around the corner out of the side of this picture, that very thing happened. And it happened in October of uh, 
1843. I've got to get out of this here. I'm talking too much. Now. Where's my cursor? Come on. There you are. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. I may be wrong. Farming 10 breaches. Here we are here. October of 43. There was a big storm. They couldn't get the water out of the canal fast enough. It overflowed just around the corner from where I was showing you. That wall went into the Farmington River along with a boat that was passing. It happened to be filled with coal from Pennsylvania, which had come up from New York City. And that coal is still said to be found on the bottom of the Farmington River down there. I've never seen any, but it's entirely possible. <laughs> so uh, this cost a lot to fix. And so, as I say, it was not without its, its disadvantages. Now, since we're here, and I could pass this by, but I guess I'll stop and we'll look at the aqueduct. From there. The aqueduct brought water to the canal from the Farmington River up here in Unionville, where there was a dam 10 feet high, which impounded all the water of the Farmington River. The lake behind it went almost all the way to Unionville, and they took water from that as they needed it to fill the canal. It went through this feeder, which is at the same level of the canal, which is the same level of the river here, and all the way down here to the west side of the river. And they had to use the aqueduct to get the water across the river and then down into Farmington and down on its way to New Haven. See, this is where we were before. The water came right down this way from the feeder, went up across the aqueduct and down like this, and then on its way to New Haven. This is the major source of water for the canal between Granby and New Haven. And so when it comes here to this point here, part of it flows north to Granby, part of it flows south to New Haven. So this is one reason they had to build the aqueduct. The other reason is that if you continue the canal north along this ridge line, it eventually peters out in Simsbury and you have to get to the other side of the river to find the long level to get through Simsbury up into Granby, up to Latimer Hill and so on. Dr. Waller, wasn't yep. Wasn't the uh Aqueduct is about 30 feet above the river? About 35, 36 feet above, yes. I'll show you some of that now. Um, there are too many pictures of this, but I'll show you some of them. Again, uh, here is the, uh, the canal coming north from Farmington, where it had to be put for commercial purposes because all of the big storehouses and merchants' establishments in Farmington Center were on this side of the river. Uh, the engineers and some of the stockholders wanted to build it on the other side of the river and avoid building the aqueduct. But things being as they were, this was a commercial venture. It had to go to the center of Farmington since it did that. It had to come up this side of the river and then to get back to their source of river, the water, they had to get over the aqueduct. So it's coming across and what I want you to notice are these lines on either side of the canal. Those lines indicate the amount of land that had to be seized from local landowners to build the canal. Now, where they're close to the canal, it was dug pretty much close into the ground or along here in the side of the hill where you can still see it along the side of Route 10 going into Farmington. But when you get up here, you're into the Farmington River Valley, which is 1,200 feet wide and 36 feet deep at this particular level. And so you have to seize a lot of land on both sides to fill the valley with sand to a, to a height of about three and a half stories so you can take your canal to the edge of the river and cross the aqueduct. Then on the other side, you know, we do the same thing. So you have embankment and a big abutment and another abutment and another big embankment over here, basically filling the river valley at the side of the river with three and a half stories of wet sand that has to be held back with stone. So, uh, this is a contemporary, more or less, picture of what the aqueduct looked like. Um, this is a picture, a modern picture from probably the 1950s, 1972. Uh, it gets across the point of how it worked very well. It's got about six major inaccuracies in it, but it doesn't make any difference. This is to show you the concept of how it worked. And it was high, as you say, three and a half stories above the water. Uh, the fence is one of the inaccuracies. It was a rickety little fence. It wasn't anything like that. Some people were scared enough they got off and went across on a boat and got back on on the other side. 
the animals had their troubles going across too sometimes. You notice these mules have blinders on. Um, it was probably a scary thing for people who hadn't been very high in their lives and never seen anything like this before. This is a picture from the 1880s which shows it in decay and falling apart. Um, you can see uh, the second pier, the third pier, the fourth pier, the fifth pier, the sixth pier, and then the northern abutment here. You can see some of the trunk here, the diagonal braces that hold the weight of the water uh, in the spans. The spans are 40 feet long, and they need some support in the middle because they're full of that heavy 62 and a half pound water. And here you see part of the trunk still standing. It's six feet high. And there's another one on the other side, 14 feet from it, so that the flue on top is 14 feet wide and six feet deep. Um, if we want to look at a little bit more detail, I can show you pier side. And this is how it was put together with the towpath up here on top of the horns of the piers. And here we have a horn. Uh, and this is the end of a 40-foot span, and the diagonal braces to support the, the weight in the center. And then you have girders going underneath with iron braces to keep the trunk from falling out in the middle because you have maybe 400 tons of water up here. And it's something you have to be careful with. Uh, every 10 years, all of this rotted away and had to be replaced. Uh, I can show you at midstand, I can show you at pier top, it looked like this. These are 10 by 12 chestnut timbers, six of them in a span, seven spans, 42 chestnut trees, four stories high and straight, 10 by 12 at the top, had to be cut by hand and put here every time they replaced this aqueduct, and this wasn't the only aqueduct. A lot of work here. Uh, how do we know the dimensions? I can could, I could almost vouch for this except to where the nails are, and even now I could probably tell you the nails uh, because I just got another source of where nails came from. But what I wanted to show you was, and I am having trouble with, yeah, let's just go back to one of these and see if I can find what I wanted to show you. The Bill of Timbers. In 1837, this was built in 36. In 1837, they had to replace it. And so we have a surviving Bill of Timbers. This is what they bought to rebuild the trunk. And so we can reconstruct that, and that's why I get, where I get my pictures from. This all fits together like a jigsaw puzzle very nicely. Here are the northern three piers and the northern abutment. About 1905, someone built a house here in the canal on the top. What a good place to build a house. This is what it looks like looking downstream in 1935. Uh, the first three piers are gone, but if we look at this, we see how it was when it was originally there. I've drawn in the three piers that are missing and, of course, the trunk and the, and the railing. This is uh, the embankment coming out. This is the southern embankment. Route 10 is off the picture to the right. Uh, this is the abutment here. It doesn't look like it here, but this is about three and a half stories from the towpath up here down to the river down here. There's an awful lot of sand that was moved to fill that valley. This is the only picture we have of the first pier. In the 1880s, it was too good to pass up and it was torn down and hauled away to form the foundation for the old Farmington Town Hall, which is now torn down and the stones are scattered again. But that's the only picture we have of that pier. Uh, this is the same, uh, the abutment, actually behind it you can see, partly destroyed by water running down the canal after the trunk rotted out and erosion, and partly probably because when they built a slope in here to haul this thing away, they, they destroyed part of the rest of it. But this picture probably predates uh, when they took that all apart. This is a picture in the 1930s, which shows the pier gone and the canal cut down in a ramp right through the abutment. This is where the first, second, and third piers used to stand. And here's a nice picture of four, five, and six. And you can see the wing walls from the northern abutment here on this side. This picture is interesting because it shows 
the indentations that were built by the masons in here to catch the bottoms of the diagonals which supported the centers of the spans. And you could imagine a 40 foot span with six feet of water on top of it, 14 feet wide, weighs a lot. And so they needed support for the center of the spans and those diagonal timbers went out each way to abut the bottom on a pier, one on this side and one on the other side. So the weight from the center of the span was transferred through that timber to the side of the pier where it was canceled out from the force on the other side and then the weight of the water on the span transmitted to the rock on the bottom of the river that the pier is built on. All very nice. Uh, the bottoms of the tri diagonals were spiked in here and we do have a picture of one of the spikes here. This part was embedded in the stonework back here and there's a crude nut on the outside that was used to hold the diagonal in place against the stonework. Unfortunately, that we have the picture of it, but it, that has disappeared and is no longer available. Don't know where it went. Um, was in a museum and vanished. Now, as I say, I'm not going to talk a long time tonight, but I just want to take you up to Northampton and show you where it's going. So we've gone all the way through the Congamon Ponds and through Westfield and Southampton, East Hampton, and up to Northampton. This is the north end of the Hampshire and Hamden Canal or of the New Haven and Northampton Canal. And this is the series of locks going down 48 feet to the Connecticut River, which is out here. There is no Massachusetts map. There was, but it was lost in a fire shortly after it was made. And so I've had to remake it myself. Not as nice and not as accurate, but all we have. Uh, this is an aerial view from 1962, predates I-95 or I-91. And you can see the canal route is going down like this. Uh, 32, 31, 30, and 29 are the lock numbers into the Connecticut River with just a little spike of land out here. If we go down in this, that's an old picture of lock 32 from Mr. Hart. This is a newer picture that I took in the 90s showing the stone on one side and the stone on the other side of the lock here. The earth built up to support the locks. Towpath was on the side off to the right. Uh, because it was near Northampton and more or less accessible as happened everywhere along the canal when it went out of business, New Englanders recycled. And so any stone that was accessible was hauled away. What's left was just too difficult or too muddy or too hard to get out. It's interesting to notice though, that, as it say, the locks on this canal were built of wood, supported by stone retaining walls for reasons of economy. These two going into the Connecticut River were the only two that were built from the beginning of stone. And this was done because when the river flooded in the spring, it was felt that it would float these two wooden locks away if they hadn't built them in stone. So these two, 31 and 32, are built in stone. And these are the remains of the bottoms of the stone linings, which were watertight in their day. This one goes into the Connecticut River. Uh, and this is, again, looking in from the river. And there are the earth mounds. And the lock is right here and lifted up about probably the better part of 10 feet to lock 31. Now we look the, get rid of this junk and I go to the next spot. Here we're looking in 1933 uh, from lock 32 into the river and the river is out here and this is the end of the canal as it enters the river. This is a more modern picture which I took in 92 showing the same thing, higher water. And this is the very end of the canal showing the river out here. Again, looking into the mouth of the canal from the river. And now we have an interesting situation. Yes, we have the canal entering the river. We have canal boats, and this is more or less to scale. And we have this little tongue of land out here. Shows on the aerial pictures. We have this thing out here. That is a riverboat. That is the shape of a typical riverboat. It's 20 feet wide, maybe 40, 45 feet long, whereas canal boats are 75 feet long and 12 feet wide. 
it's obvious that something happened in New Haven that they hadn't really thought about, or not too much. Riverboats won't fit on the canal. You have to have some place to exchange goods. You can't do it in the canal. You can't really do it in the river. And we have this interesting little spit of sand out there all these years later. I can't prove it, and nothing says so, but I suspect there was something like that built either of sand or of timber in the river where the canal boats could tie up on one side and the river boats on the other side to do what was happening in New Haven Harbor between ocean boats and canal boats. It just had to be. Uh, this is one of the reasons why <coughs> the canal was not as successful as New Haven had hoped with the trade from northern New England, because canal boats wouldn't fit on the river and you had to transship everything. Furthermore, they were bucking about 150 years worth of established commerce on the Connecticut River where patterns had been set for generations and riverboat men would stop but not necessarily pick up or if they did pick up wouldn't necessarily take where you wanted it to go first they would go where they were going first on the river and so things were not working the way that they had hoped that they would work um, there was a definite climate of riverites and canalites new haven versus hartford they fought their wars they sabotaged one another's installations a lot of bad feeling, and this was probably reflected here in the years of history of commerce on the river and not being too cooperative with picking up and delivering canal stuff uh, timely. Plus, the stuff had to be warehoused if there wasn't a canal boat, right? Or the other way around, if there was, wasn't a river boat. There was probably a warehouse up on this hill someplace, but I don't know. Toward the end of the canal's life, things got a little bit more exciting because the canal company said they helped the river boats. They hired themselves a steamboat. So the canal company had a steamboat on the Connecticut River towing canal boats north to Greenfield, which worked quite successfully toward the end of the canal's life, where they could offer 72-hour service between New York City and Greenfield, Massachusetts, which isn't too bad even by today's standards if you're shipping heavy stuff. So uh, that's where it was going, and that's more or less why it didn't work out. But uh, again, it didn't work out for more basic reasons than that. Uh, this was a time in the history of the country when things were going as they had been in colonial times from basically north-south traffic to now we're getting the Erie Canal open and the old northwest open. Things are beginning to go east-west. The Erie Canal was a tremendous success. The Hampshire and Hamden Canal and the Farmington Canal were dismal failures, and partly because there never was that much trade and commerce in northern New England to begin with, as the railroads find out when they finally went that way. But uh, it just it was going the wrong place at the wrong time. And the technology was, yeah, maybe 50 or 60 years out of date, and railroads were coming in and railroads can climb hills and take more direct routes. They're cheaper to make, they, to make, they're cheaper to maintain, they're cheaper to operate, they operate year round. After all, this is a lot of water and it freezes in the winter and it's closed in the spring until about May when they get a chance to refill it and to get the junk out of it and get it ready to go if they've got enough money to start operations. So railroads were superior, but even they did not have tremendous success compared with the New York Central, for instance or anything going east and west on the water level route west, which followed the old Erie Canal. And the best way to, ex to sort of illustrate that is to tell you that when the Erie Canal was built, they did it from a very clever point of view, politically and economically, they built the middle part first. And people found out how convenient that was. And then they built the western part, and then they finally built the eastern part. And then it all worked. But before they built the east part and the west part, and they only had the middle part out in the middle of nowhere, they had a thousand boats on it. This canal operated for about 20 years, for its whole length maybe 10 years or 12 years. And I've been looking for you know, the names of canal boats and they're listed on the map fronts of the first two maps, but the most I can come up with is you know, maybe 100 boats. Now that's orders of magnitude away from the Erie when it was just the middle of the Erie Canal and didn't go anywhere on either end. And it just shows 
what was happening to trade and commerce at that time of the republic's history and how things were changing from the way they used to be. I mean, New Haven would trade up and down. They would take wagons from Plainville to Georgia and back and forth that way. They go to Africa, they go to Europe, but it's about to change and uh, New York is going to become the central shipping point for everything to the west, which is why the Hampshire and Hamden Canal had his contractors go bankrupt because they couldn't sell all the stock. There wasn't enough capital in Western Massachusetts. It was all in Boston the way it is now. But this canal was going to feed the Port of New York, which the Port of Boston was not interested in, so they wouldn't fund this canal. So it got funded by New Haven in Connecticut. It also got funded in Massachusetts by, by New Haven, but uh, it took a lot, a lot of doing to get that done. And it wasn't funded from, from Massachusetts sources. And with that, I've said enough, I guess. Have anybody got any questions? Yes? Where, on that current map where it shows Northampton, where would like 91 be today? Is that actually Main Street itself? That was uh, Stone Arc. Let's see. This is, um, this is an 1890 map. So it's got all the railroads. Uh, this is Water Street. I, thought, I think it's called Damon Street. And King Street's going along there. The, this is King, that's Water and Damon and Union. No, State, State is, uh, State is this street here because State Street was the canal before it became State Street. And then it goes out like this. This is King Street here, going like that. And Water Street and Damon Road is. Oh yes, for sure. Uh, I can show you if I go, uh, let's see, how am I gonna do this? We'll go backwards. This is, this is the cor corner of Damon Road and, and King here, but let's see what I've got in here. This is the 1830 map showing the canal, but that's earlier than you want. Here we go, here, and you can see how the canal is going from the end of State Street straight across like this. Here is water, I think it's now called Damon, and, and King Street's doing this, and I-95 is going right up like this and if I go along there this is a very interesting picture because this is an aerial photograph from 1941 if you can believe it but look at Northampton doesn't exist in 1941 I show this to people in Northampton and they just can't believe it it's all farms there's no canal because it's been filled in by the farmers but here's the canal coming up like this out of the river and going over as far as the railroads, and then it takes off this way to the end of State Street. But there is basically nothing there within living memory. And this is, is just going to be showing the route through uh, downtown Northampton. Um, and over here, we've got another aqueduct. This is the aqueduct across the Mill River, uh, where they had to cross the river to get into the center of Northampton. Uh, it was sighted back up there on the other side of this road bridge, which is still standing. Uh, basically, you know, went across you know, like that. And this house, interestingly enough, is built on the embankment of the, of the aqueduct. The abutment is gone, but it used to look like that. And that house is built, built right in it and it used to go across the Mill River and the earth on either side of it, across the valley over here, and it ends up just next to the library. So it came across like that, looking north or looking the other way, like this, with the piers coming across, and then finally I've got one, uh, yeah, like that, up to State Street where it went across and then into the center of Northampton. So if you go up there now where the uh, canal entered the river, is there a plaque or something? No? It's a very hard place to get to. It may be a little different now because the Northampton Rowing Club took over an old asphalt plant which is just next to the canal and they have <laughs> built some places in the river where boats can dock and you can have a small park and a picnic, and I don't think they've interfered with the end of the canal, but it's just upriver from there, and they may have put in some amenities that make it easier to get there. I don't think they touched anything on the, on the, 
on the canal itself. It would be pretty hard to move those stones anyway, but they could certainly trash it if they wanted to. But it's really a very isolated area. You have to go and park in a, an apartment house parking lot, clamber through the apartments, and then down about two stories over no rock, no paths or trails or anything. You just jump off the edge and go through onto the bushes down to get to this place. Uh, but when you get there, it's worth it. And that's partly why the stones are still there because they were too hard to get out. For instance, it, let me show you something else just in terms of, if I'm not boring you, tell me if I'm boring you because... Yeah, one more question back here. Go ahead. actually splits and there's a home there and the water actually goes by the home was it built at one time that you're talking about lock 12 it sounds like the lock? the lock the house is the lock keeper's house the lock 12 restoration is right there and should be very easy to see it's a stone lined lock it uh, is it's on the edge of a hillside where the canal drops about eight feet into a swamp and because the the land is alternatively wet and dry as the seasons go. The timber lock lining rotted out and had to be replaced during the course of the canal's life with a stone line lock, which is the lock 12 restoration, which is still there. And it too was on a dairy farm in the middle of nowhere and survived this recycling of the stone, to put it politely. Uh, and so that is there. The Skew Arch Bridge, which is a railroad bridge, is, is also there. Uh, and this is where the uh, canal and the railroad begin to, to part in Cheshire. By the time you get to northern Cheshire, they pretty much come completely apart because the railroad can climb grades and can take a more direct route, whereas the canal is stuck with being level so the water doesn't run out of it. And pretty soon when you get to a little bit farther north to Southington, it's on the long level where it doesn't change with a lock for 26 miles. and. Uh, that's, that's why they, they come apart. They could climb together directly along the canal's path until they get high enough up where the canal and the railroad can separate to the benefit of the railroad. I can show you pictures of that if you're interested, but I just want to talk about the recycling of things. This is something that never had a chance. And this is the great aqueduct over the Great River in, North, in Westfield. It's 320 feet long. It's the longest aqueduct on the canal, not the highest, but it's so big, though we have contemporary pictures of it, we don't have one picture that shows the whole thing. So we've got the northern half of it here, and then we've got most of the middle of it here, looking north, those are the Pocasic Hills out to the west. And then we've got the southern span here, which is very nice and, and very much parallels what I found in Farmington. These are all built according to the same plans. And you can see the towpath bridge and the guard lock there. And then we have these pictures that show it. Well, it's now out of business. This picture is about 1850. The thing went out of business in 1848. We've got over here the abutment in disrepair. We've got pieces of wood. We got all kinds of stuff. And of course, they're taking the easy parts first, right next to the shore. It's still standing in the middle. They've taken the timber from this one. They haven't gotten to this one yet, but it's coming apart. Skip that. This is the site today. There's nary a thing to be seen except the break in water where it's going over the stone. But this is what it looked like then. And this is where it crossed. You can see the stone outcropping up there that held the bottoms of the piers. And when we get closer, they weren't too careful when they took things apart and they lost some overboard. So here's a nice rounded stone that was a corner of one of the piers. There's another one with a, a drill hole in it with a rounded corner. It's still on the bottom of the river. You only see them about every 10 years when there's a drought. But if you go there at the right time, you find them. All right, enough diversions. <laughs> Unless you want to see the Lock 12 restoration. Yes, another question. Yeah, with the, regard to the uh, feeder, I guess, canal. Um, the which? The, the feeder? The dam in uh, Unionville. Yes. And then the aqueduct in the farm. Right. Where did the uh, water from the dam join the canal? Run into the canal. 
just west of the, I show you that, it's just west of the, of the aqueduct. Um, and this is a beautiful thing to see, actually. I, sh I should, sh if I can find that doggone cursor, where are you? Wow, uh, I wanna go to town, Farmington, one up. And now we're gonna go right over here. See this is where the feeder comes down from Unionville. There's the aqueduct. And here is the canal running north to Granby. And there's this tongue of land here. Look at the amount of land that they've had to seize to carve this hillside away to get it to the level of the long level along here. Now, if we go, this is what the canal just west of the aqueduct looked like in the 1930s. Absolutely beautiful to look at. It's no longer there. And again, another beautiful picture. You're looking west from the house that was built in the aqueduct. This is kind of what it looks like today, overgrown. But this is the thing. This is the juncture. You remember that map with the pointed hill? This is going to Unionville. The water's coming here. It's going behind us to New Haven. It comes down here and turns this way and goes to Granby. And this is where the actual connection was made for the feeder to the, uh, aqua or to the canal itself. I think this is just now we're looking. Okay, I think with that, we'll thank Carl for his uh, tremendous insight. <laughs> Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>